My name is Dylan Dooley and from a very early age I've been told many heartwarming stories about a German factory by the name of Braun located just a five minute walk from my home in Carlow town. Braun came to Carlow in 1974 and remained in operation for the next three and a half decades. At its peak, Braun was the town's single largest employer, allowing almost 1,500 locals to make a living. Braun initially produced hair dryers and other personal care products. However, in its latter years, Braun produced Oral-B oral care products. If you've had any connection to Carlow Town in the past, you will most likely have heard about Braun in some capacity, perhaps without even noticing. I'm on a mission to capture some of those inspiring stories first-hand from none other than some of the staff members who spent a large portion of their lives working in Braun. I want you at home, whether you worked in the factory or not, to share in the tales of happiness, friendship, pride and laughter which unfolded behind the factory walls and which made Braun one of Carlo's most popular employers. This year, 2020, marks 10 years since the closure of that factory, a very emotional day in local history which remains engraved in the minds of local people to this very day. Let's go back to the very beginning. Meet Dermot O'Brien, a local man who worked in Braun for many years. He recalls the building of this brand new factory. We were thrilled when we saw it going up on a big plot of land. What was here originally was a farm belonged to the mental hospital. And that's, that's the site that it was. There was no O'Brien Road going up at the time. That was all built to coincide with the building of the factory. I started there because I was walking up by the fence one day and decided I needed to try and get a job for the summer. And within and inquired, I think that was in 1976, I think it was. And got an application form and started off there then in the moulding department and shift work. When we started first, it was absolutely incredible. We knew everybody and everybody knew everybody's name we knew where they came from and there was always, always great crack, great camaraderie within the place. Dermot also told me about a Facebook page he set up especially for former employees of the factory. He told me about what inspired him to set up the page and also the reaction it generates from those employees. I run a page called Old Carla Photos. I've been doing that for a number of years and I realised the effect that uh, page had on people in terms of memories and stories and keeping keeping memories alive so I decided to set up the one for Braun running on the same kind of lines and that has proved to be very popular yet yeah, because people are keeping in contact through that now more so it's people are finding out this maybe you know an old friend or an old employee that they knew has passed away it's an important area for people to go to to try and find out a little bit of information. It also has little snippets about the factory. We put up a lot of the old newsletters that were available and put them up for people to see because we would call them the, the Braunettes, I think, and the Yes Let's and a couple of names like that. Uh, so it's, yeah, it is a good way for, for people to keep in contact. Dermot and his friends had a unique hobby which became a weekly ritual for them. I was called Kermit when I was in the store. I can't remember why. We used to have, say, shift work on every Friday night. We used to bring in a motorbike, put the motorbike in the store and clean it. You know, you had your work done, so there was there was no, there was never any hassle. Uh, but you know, these little things like that, just people remembered, you know. Dermot got to see some of his former colleagues at Braun reunions, but let's just say some of their appearances had changed over time. <laughs> it was very funny. Nobody thinks that he got old <laughs> until you go to something like that and you suddenly say, oh, he looks old. Well, if he looks old, I must look old. So yeah, no, it's great. It's great to catch up with people. And, you know, in lots of cases, you know, God, you can remember their first name, you can remember the last name, you can't remember, you can't remember their full name. But I mean, when they got together, like the stories that people had about, about various things that went on in the factory and things that they did, uh, it, was, it was amazing. The next voice you hear is Ellen Shields, a Wexford native who moved from her home county to work in Braun. Ellen shared a fascinating story of the night before she started working in Braun. I was so surprised by what she told me. The night before I went to work in Braun, I had no, no place to stay or anything. So I came up uh, to Carlow, went around and looked, knocked on various doors. So I ended up uh, staying with a woman that was only after burying her husband. She had a son there, he was into all sorts of tricks. When I come back after the weekend sometimes he had these pet and white mice and I, I was scared of my life of them. 
and uh, he could often put parts of a bike in the bed and I'd lie <laughs> up into the bed and the next thing oh the first day there were 25 other people with me so we went through induction which was rules and regulations and our handbook and everything like that and when we went down onto the shop floor even though there was 25 of us there was only 15 of us went down there because 10 of them went home I ended up staying there for 23 years Ellen fulfilled various representative roles in which she acted as a voice for fellow employees. She told me one story in particular, which made her laugh as she shared that memory. The management would insist sometimes you had to wear PPE, personal protective equipment, like safety shoes and things like that. But some of the lads, just some of the lads, very few. But I used to have to go in to the gents' area, not into the toilet now, but into the area. And they were showing me their feet and all and telling me that they had webbed feet and everything, they couldn't wear the safety shoes. And I'd have to go back and really look at this and how am I going to present this to management to tell them and, and to stop the person from being sacked. I used to always try as well to stop a person getting a verbal warning because I said if you're, you're earmarked, once you get a verbal warning, you have 30 days to behave yourself. But that means you have to behave yourself with all the other things as well. That's what people didn't realise. But of course, I didn't condone wrong either. Amongst her many representative roles, Ellen acted as head of the Braun Sports and Social Club, which proved to be incredibly popular with employees. She told me all about that club. Uh, I was chairperson of the Braun Sports and Social Club, so I used to organise events for people and you'd collect the money and all beforehand. We went to the race in the Curra, had arranged that we went into the sportsman's inn on the way up. We ordered uh, tea and scones, had them, and then they showed us what was on the menu for coming back, the hot food. So we placed an order for the hot food. And <coughs> went on to the races anyway, I'm sure I had, I was placing a bet. I wasn't used to going to the races anyway, but I had 10 euro in my hand, but I only wanted to put five euro on, but these people that where you place your bet are so fast and the lingo that they used, I was like this and they handed me back a slip of paper and they took the whole tenor but I only wanted to put a fiver on so I had this slip in my hand <laughs> it was going around and the name of the horse that I had backed was winning on every fence all the way around and I was the very same as if it was the jockey myself <laughs> I was like this and when I got to the end with excitement didn't I throw away the ticket I couldn't find the ticket to go back when the race was over to collect the money so the people that were that long term that know all about going to the races said to me now Ellen you're going to have to fill up this form so there was a part on the, for, on the form where I had to fill up how did you mislead or whatever and I said I threw it away with excitement so they said I'd have to wait six months to see that no one picked it up and and whatever you call it and cashed it in before they'd reimburse me. And sure, the horse was after winning that nine to one. And because they took a tenner out, I would have got good money back. I'd have got my own tenner, nine times 10 and 10. So that's what I could have got. I heard many stories about Braun's commitment to giving back to the local community. They organised many fundraisers in aid of a range of local charities. One particular fundraiser, however, stands out to Ellen. Well, at one stage I got a call to know would I was I prepared to do something to raise money for? I didn't even know what name the charity was that was coming up to stage. Because I was in you know, a meeting in management and of course I just said yes without even thinking any further. But anyway, I was a pig rodeo down in the mart here in Carlow, opposite Carpenters. There was people like John Litterich, Fast Eddie Roberts and a few more people. And I was put down as Showdown Shields. That was the name they put on me. So. We went in that evening anyway, and what we had to do was, they had, the, like the setup in the mart was like, uh, you know, there was raised steps, like being up on a balcony where people were sitting all around. And I have a brother living in Carlow and he had two sons at that time that were very young. But I, I was dressed up in a boiler suit. I had to come in and we were all out the back. And people were giving me ideas, it was, uh, you had to catch this bun, like to me it was a pig, but it was only a bun. And I was so scared of it, like, <laughs> so we're out the back and we're prepared and the best thing to do. So someone gave me the advice, like, listen here, when you catch that bun, it's going to slip out of your hand. So if you get some clay and put, rub it in your hand and have it here in your pocket when you catch on, 
set the tail like it'll be able to hold down to it. I did that and I got on to so I held the bun up like this and your man commented and he said, You think she was saying free Nelson Mandela? <laughs> and I went sliding over things so I had I had dressed up the boiler suit too with a gun and holster and things like that and a cowboy hat and this and the other. So some of the kids were at as I came out were looking for the gun or the cap the cap you were wearing or whatever. So I thought that was funny. I spoke to Vonnie Nocter, a Carlo lady who worked in Braun for a period spanning an incredible 26 and a half years. She vividly remembers the application process and her first day working in the factory. I went for an aptitude test and I then uh, the next day I got word to go for an interview. When I went for the interview in Braun, I never forget it was on a Friday and I went in there and they asked me a few questions. I wasn't working at the time. They said to me, if we offered you a job, when would you be able to start? And I said, I'll go in and work now if you want. And they all said, oh, that's great. How about Monday morning? I said, that's great. I started at eight o'clock that morning. There was a few other girls with me. Uh, we were brought up to the training room. There was a lot of talk on how the factory worked and stuff like that and break time and what it'd be like to be in big crowds there like that and what you'd have to do and stuff like that. There was girls there from 16 and 17 and they were brought down on the floor the same day then at 12 o'clock to start working on the line. I was 18 so I was kept until two o'clock myself and say two or three other girls and we were brought down then at two o'clock to start working on the line. And I'll never forget, the place looked so big and looked like there were so many people in it. I just felt I was in awe of it. And my first job was crimping rivets. They just added the wire to the rivets and crimped them. And they were part of the element for the hairdryer. I was curious to find out what it was about Braun that kept Vani and so many others working in the factory for so many years. I worked 26 and a half years in Braun. I loved going into work. When I was in on 3 to 11, I could be in Braun for half two and I'd go in on the line. Uh, maybe one of my friends would be on the opposite shift and I'd go in and have a chat with them before my shift would start. I never felt like I was there 26 and a half years. Oh, it definitely is a lifetime. I was only 18 going in there. A young girl like those 20 six and a half years I don't know where they went. Vonnie also drew my attention to a very important point the new opportunities which the factory created for local women. On the assembly lines that time at the very very start for a long time there was not only ladies worked on the line eventually in the last maybe five years maybe ten years at the latest then to start getting men to work on the lines. But other than that, it was all the ladies running the lines. Oh, it was great. You can imagine, not only women all over the place, like the laughing and the whole lot. I mean, it was unbelievable. Like, you'd be sitting on the line and you could be working, say, a four to a table. And every day was always a different subject. We'd go in and we talk about today could be religion, tomorrow could be politics. The girls were talking about their boyfriends, their husbands, their children. Anything could come into it, we'd be there, we'd be laughing, the next thing there could be a row with someone, but at the end of the day it really was a good place to work. Bonnie also shared memories of the Christmas parties organised by the Braun Sports and Social Club. So much money every week was taken out of our wages, we signed a form to say we'd do it, mm. and that money went to children's Christmas parties, they were absolutely brilliant, and anyone that was married, whatever children they had, they got, if they had five children, they got five tickets. If they had two children, they got two tickets. If you were single and had no children, you get one ticket. And um, of course, I'd bring any of my nieces or nephews or godchildren, whoever at the time was at the proper age for to go to the parties. And they got great presents. There was no scrimping and scraping there. Bonnie filled me in on how Braun's treatment of their staff was second to none. She talked me through the rewards that Braun gave to employees as a recognition of their hard work. And then always for perfect attendance, they'd give you a present. You get extra days off, you get your bonus at Christmas, 
And then, say around March or April, then they'd bring you up for the perfect attendance. One year I got a watch, another year I got a camera, another year I got a big radio, and they put on a lovely spread there, and you'd have something to eat and the whole lot, and you got your photo taken, and I've never heard tell of anywhere else to do anything like that. I sat down with Cathy Harland, who was the resident nurse in Braun. I wanted to know what it was like to be the only nurse in such a large factory. Now, it was a whole new thing, because I was a ward sister in England, and this was a whole new thing to me, but I had done quite a lot of um, work as regards meeting people in the hospital and, and that, and it, it was months later, and I was talking to Ned Gillette. He was back, back in, in Ireland again, and... I, I said to him, why did you choose me? And he said, well, he said, you came across so well at evaluating people and what have you. Some days I would see maybe 45 or 50 people and they, I never knew what was going to come through my door. I really didn't. They would come up to me and I, and I would say to them, look, you're fine, you can go back to work and what have you. And they could go back down and tell the supervisor, I said they were to go home, yeah? And he'd send them home. I only found this out because one supervisor said to me, why are you sending so many people home? I said, what do you mean? He said, so-and-so came back down to me the other day and said, sent them home. I said, I sent the, that person back to work. So I got all these passes and printed and all sent down to the supervisor. So they had to go to their supervisor to get permission to come to the medical centre. So they would give them the pass, right? And it was a duplicate. So, and I would keep the back part and give them the to go back and say, turn to work um, or retained in the medical centre for half an hour or whatever. So that squashed that bit. On a Monday morning, I would dispense Alka-Seltzer as if they were going out of fashion. <laughs> I was told so many stories about entire families, even multiple generations from a single family working together. Cathy knew what it was like to work under the same roof as her family, as she, her husband and her son all worked in Braun. Well, it was, it was just myself and my husband first. So when he came to work in Ron, I referred to him as Joe, but he's now he's John. So we were on a night out one night and we were in Reddy's and um, it was a celebration. It was, I think somebody's birthday or something anyway. This girl was down, lowered on me. I was up kind of high and she came up and she said, does he know that you have a um, boyfriend? And I said, He's John, and you're always talking about Joe. I said, yeah. And how long have you known this Joe for? Oh, I said, uh, since I got married. What do you mean since you got married? I said, I said, do you think that I have a, have an affair? Oh, yeah, she said, everybody thinks that. So I said, no. I said, meet the man I married, Joseph John. <laughs> so by the time my husband left Braun in 82, Stephen came in and Mark came in. So we weren't all, weren't all there mm. together. It wouldn't have been a good situation, really, because their father, he was a training manager at this stage. So I was there on my own. And then the lads came in mm. after that. But it, it was good, but I treated them all the same. But it wasn't only once-off fundraising campaigns which employees supported. They also had the option to have money deducted from their paycheck to support local charities, as Cathy explains. We supplied the first defibrillators to the ambulances in Carlo, cancer research. They would have um, people from Brown going to Lourdes every year and they would pay for that. And families and people in need. The number of people that benefited from our donations out of our wages, it was massive. Brown was also involved in raising money for the swimming pool. Not the one that we have now, they were going to have a swimming pool uh, for Carlo. And that fell through. Uh, the land wasn't available anymore. So then it was donated to Father Jim in Grey when he started. He went out and dug himself. and. The money that we had collected for the swimming pool was given to him for his pool. There were so many characters in the place and there was so much done, it's hard to remember it all now. Cathy witnessed the growth and development of so many young people during her time in Braun. I suppose the biggest impact was to see young people and maybe the mother and father already working in Braun. 
and how naive they were and gradually to see them grow like a flower. It, it was just phenomenal to see the progress that they made and how they were able to interact with it weren't in the beginning they'd be very shy and that especially the country people very very shy and then with the interaction be to see them blossom and then form a relationship and get married and start a family I saw them all going through it was just it's hard to describe the impact that Brown had on Carlo and, and its people. And when you think about it, the families that went through, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, and it, it was outstanding. I suppose the same as the sugar company, really. Mm. Carlo should be very proud to have had Brown, and Brown was very proud to be in Carlo. I was glad to hear that the closure of the factory did not impact the friendships which were carefully crafted behind its walls. Oh yes, I still have friends that I'd um, meet up with every so often. It's a while now since we had a, a brawn reunion. As you say, it comes down to meeting all the people and making friends. And that's what life is about. I mean, we're only here for a short time and everybody needs friends. Only for brawn, I wouldn't know as many people. Sure, I used to be broke because I was invited to everything. I was invited to their christenings and I was invited to when their daughters got married, their sons got married, when they were so many years married, everything, a celebration. Of course, I love that too. I love socialising. I'd heard so many highlights from friends and family who had previously worked in Ron, but I wanted to know from Bonnie, Dermot, Cathy and Ellen what their biggest highlights were. I'd have to say the highlights, um, it'd be the people I met through through Braun, like now there would be a lot of them have gone ahead, have died, like, but there were some great characters, and I mean some very good characters in the elderly women, as I would have called them then. But you know what? They were gas. They were the ones that kept the place going, and some of them were the cleaners. There was other women worked on the line, but you know what? They were lovely. They were really nice people. But the greatest pleasure I used to get was to help packing the stuff for perfect attendance and wrapping it and training people to be first aiders. The number of first aiders that I had and the team of first aiders I had, they were brilliant. They were absolutely brilliant. I could not have worked without them. I would not have been able to work without them. Looking at, looking at a production line coming in off a lorry with just um, bits and pieces and watching the lads assemble it and then watching the um, the end product coming off the line. I mean, that was there was always a thrill to be had out of seeing something like that, where there was an empty space on the floor. Suddenly there was machinery in there and looking like very complicated machinery. And it, it was always wonderful to see the end product coming out, I have to say. It definitely opened up your mind to different, different people's attitudes and how people work and how people approach different things. That was one good way to go in there and you'd learn it, you'd have it all learned in a few years with, with your experience and mingling with the people. Braun was no stranger to celebrity visitors and had many well-known faces pass through their doors on a number of occasions. Charlie Hawhey, Daniel O'Donnell, Joe Duffy and Mike Murphy to name but a few. Ellen and Cathy were fortunate enough to meet some of those famous guests. Initially, my boss was a personnel manager. And then I came under the manager for health and safety. And I was right by reception anyway. The boss that I had would be mainly the one that would invite them. She would bring in TDs and the whole lot. So I met them all. I Mary O'Rourke. I had her in the medical centre, actually. And she, oh, she was a great character lovely person. But I, I did a met Daniel because of the charity that we all donated to out of our wages and he was building all those little bungalows in Romania and he came and he was one of his most ardent fans in the restaurant he, he, he came into and we presented him with the cheque and all that and he, he copped his ardent fan across it and uh, I want to dance with you we started singing and he went over and got her up and danced in the restaurant in the middle of it all but he was something else Dan you know Dan oh I definitely got to meet uh, Charlie Hawhey so Charlie Hawhey had met me in Braun in the daytime he recognised me and I was uh, I was downtown 
and he brought me in for a drink into a place called Kennedy's. It was there along Tullow Street. Daniel O'Donnell, I met him uh, the day he came into Brown and I had a photograph taken with him. So that's a memory I have and I still have that photograph. It should all be pushing up like, you know, it was in the, in the restaurant. They used to be all pushing up to the top, you know, as if, as if he was the Pope, like trying to put their hands on him. He was trying to keep order, it was difficult. Braun, owned by Procter & Gamble, announced on June 11, 2009, that they would be closing their Carlow factory and moving their operations to Newbridge, which would result in 100 staff transfers and 160 job losses. The reason being the decline in consumer demand for products. P&G believed it was the best option for their Irish business and would ensure the company's longevity in the future. This all happened in the summer of 2010 and Braun closed its doors for the last time on September 3rd, 2010. I asked Dermot, Ellen, Vonnie and Cathy the same question. What sort of a reaction they and so many other locals had to this sad news. It's heartbreaking, so it is, because it gave so much employment. I think the government of the day as well, I don't care what party was in or who I'm associated with at the minute, they didn't do enough to, when the, to prevent them from closing. They should be in there on an ongoing basis, I think, seeing how businesses are doing. Not waiting until D-Day when it's too, you know, it's like, you know, you're closing the gate when the horse is gone. So I think it's so sad. Sometimes you could have a, a father and father, a wife and a son working in it, and then the girlfriend, and then whatever. So it was a whole wipeout of some families. When the factory closed, I was given the chance to go in and have a look, literally just before they closed the doors on it. And I, I remember I had a van, and I drove the van into the, the assembly line. And I remember actually, as I, as I left it, I started to cry. I couldn't believe that it had gone. I couldn't understand it. Like, I mean, the, the state of the art uh, factory, there was 27 acres, um, and they were moving up to, now I didn't see, I didn't see the place in Newbridge, but by all accounts, it's not near as nice as, as what they had here in Carlow. Um, the real reason why he moved up, I honestly don't know. Uh, a lot of speculation as to why, but uh, yeah, I was very, very surprised when it happened. Every day that I pass up the road, up, up Brian Road, which is, incidentally is named after my grandfather. I think about it, yeah, yeah. Couldn't believe it. I mean, it was a big loss for Carlo. I was gone a few, just a couple of years before that. I think it was about two years before that I had retired. But you know something, it's a big loss. And it's so, so sad to go up by that factory and to see it lying idle. Every time I go by it, I often, think about the times we'd be coming out of whether it be seven o'clock in the morning after the night shift because I worked on nights whether it be three o'clock in the day or whether it be 11 o'clock at night that I walked out of those doors but all you'd hear is laughter coming out of it it's terrible sad to see it just lying there idle that the buzz used to be in there and just look at that and I was like a ghost place it was devastating because really it was kind of at the end of an era. Brown Ireland was a phenomenal place to work in. It really was. They never let people off it. They would always keep their workforce. It's obscene to go past and see it, that phenomenal place just sitting there. And it was a huge loss to Carlo. Huge. When you look at the size of Carlo now and what it was like when Brown came in, the number of houses that were built, the number families, whole families that went in there to work and were educated because of brawn. It was like a new awakening, but it was total devastation. I was heartbroken, really heartbroken. I walked away from each of the interviews feeling inspired and also envious of Cathy, Ellen, Dermot and Vonnie. Each of them had emphasised how much they enjoyed working in the factory and the sheer joy on their faces as they reminisced on those memories proved that very point. While a huge hole has been left in Braun's place, one thing is for certain, the immense legacy left behind by Braun over its 36 years will never be forgotten. Carlo Remembers Braun, 10 Years On, was produced and narrated by Dylan Dooley. Kerry Mitchell was the editor and Ariane O'Byrne was the scriptwriter. 
I would like to extend a special word of thanks to Vonnie, Dermot, Cathy and Ellen for their time, honesty and great spirits. Without their generosity and support, the making of this documentary would not have been possible.